Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier and thanks again for stopping by. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at Charles Island's Mindspeak, do take a look. Um, that's on Rich Wrap-Ups and also a sort of a piece I put together for Oracle about staying ahead of the curve if you get a chance. Looking forward to being in London this weekend uh, for the Homecoming Revolution event. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to that tremendously, not only to be in London, but to see what the diaspora is thinking. Home thoughts. Uh, I go back to Thomas Pynchon's Bleeding Edge. No matter how the official narrative of this turns out, it seemed to Heidi. These are the places we should be looking, not in newspapers or television, but at the margins, graffiti, uncontrolled utterances, bad dreamers who sleep in public and scream in their sleep. Political reflections on Monday, a vigil uh, for the passengers was held in Kuala Lumpur. This is the MH370. I'll put up an image of the flight data recorder from the 2009 Air France flight that went down in the mid-Atlantic um, and uh, it really is uh, uh, an unfortunate situation and full of open questions I'm afraid still. Reverting back to Pynchon, if they can get you asking the wrong questions they don't have to worry about the answers. Um, I like this comment uh, in a letter by Rometty of IBM to shareholders. Um, she called data a natural resource in its exponentially increasing volume, velocity and variety. Data is becoming a new natural resource. It promises to be for the 21st century what steam power was for the 18th century. Electricity was for the 19th century and hydrocarbons for the 20th century. This is what we mean by enterprises, institutions and our planet becoming smarter. Traditional computing systems which only do what they are programmed to do simply cannot keep up with big data in constant motion, Rometty said. For that we need a new paradigm. These new systems are not programmed Rather, they learn from the vast quantities of information they ingest from their own experiences and from their interactions with people. I concluded by saying the information century has arrived and then remembered this quote from Pynchon in Gravity's Rainbow. Information, what's wrong with dope and women? Is it any wonder the world's gone insane with information come to be the only real medium of exchange? I thought that was pretty good. Pyongyang, the supreme leader, Kim Jong-un, won with the unanimous approval of his district, which posted a 100% turnout. In November 2010, I wrote about the Hermit Kingdom, and I'll read the first paragraph far away. In distant lands lies the Hermit Kingdom. This land is ruled by the House of Kim, and its capital is Pyongyang. The first and eternal president was Kim Il-sung, and his successor Kim Jong-il, whose designated successor is Kim Jong-un. They all had tiny little hands and like the elves and the shoemaker. And then I said this country has nuclear weapons and on its border with its neighbor, South Korea, it's at 25,000 American soldiers. Interesting article in the South China Morning Post about how it's unfair to paint China as a colonialist in Africa. The African continent with its fast growth of the past decade is a future wonderland for, for prosperity that will benefit foreign investment and entrepreneurs. Strangely, rumors have been circulating that target China as a villain who is plundering Africa for its energy resources. That's a big lie. The real story about China and Africa is one of a long-lasting friendship based on mutual benefit and support. Friendly, friendly relations go back several decades. China's signature aid project, the Tanzania Zambia Railroad is a symbol of that strong bond. For half a century, China has offered full and unswerving support to African nations in their fight against colonialism and apartheid. 
as well as for independence and saying how these uh, ties are even stronger today annual bilateral trade in 2012 topped 200 billion dollars china's investment stood at 21.23 billion dollars more than 2,000 Chinese companies have invested in over 50 African countries in areas ranging from finance, aerospace, manufacturing, logistics, and real estate, in addition to traditional sectors like agriculture, mining, and infrastructure construction. It's true that Africa is one of the key suppliers of energy resources to China, and investment in its energy resources is rising. China now imports over one-third of its petroleum from Africa. Um, however, it must be emphasized that China's imports of oil are much less than those by the US and Europe, making a strong case uh, for um, uh, the China engagement. And I concluded by saying, look, let there be no doubt that Chinese demand for Africa's commodities took an egregious demand for Africa's commodities versus supply disequilibrium back into equilibrium. By locking in supply for term, China unwound the hand-to-mouth nature of Africa's economy. Term contracts unlocked credit and added financial capacity to Africa. The Africa GDP versus China emergence correlation is indisputable. Clearly, the West has woken up to the Chinese advance and still holds a trump card with which to tilt the African pitch. That card being hard power, plain and simple. Furthermore, given the extrapolation that Chinese demand for African commodities will continue to grow whilst the U.S.'s is shrinking, particularly in crude oil, one could argue persuasively that the pivot to Asia detours through Africa. If you are considering distant blockade operations, I am sure the U.S. and its allies will be looking at blockading or maintaining a gatekeeper status over African exports to China. The China-Africa relationship is fluid. I think China appreciates it needs to shape perceptions. Just visit the CCTV Bureau in Nairobi to gain affirmation of that fact. On that note, I'll put up a photograph of the day I was interviewed by Fermida Miller um, of CCTV. The Soviet leader Joseph Stalin used to shrug off critics by his favorite Central Asian saying, the dogs bark, the caravan moves on. Russia's hard-eyed President Vladimir Putin is following the same strategy over Ukraine and Crimea. Putin swiftly moved his knight into the empty chess square of Crimea, thereby regaining full control of one of Russia's four strategic port regions, Sevastopol, Murmansk, St. Petersburg and Vladivostok. Sevastopol now firmly in Moscow's hands as Russia's sole gateway to the Black Sea, the Mediterranean and the Middle East. The vast co-shared Russian-Ukrainian Sevastopol naval base was a shaky, awkward arrangement doomed to eventual failure. Semi-autonomous Crimea, over 60% ethnic Russian, will hold a referendum on 16th March to decide to remain in Ukraine or rejoin Russia. And clearly we know how that referendum is going to turn out. Um, jumping from there, uh, I come, came across a uh, comment made by the Chinese Foreign Ministry on Monday uh, citing Z as telling Obama the situation in Ukraine is extremely complex and what is most urgent is for all sides to remain calm and exercise restraint to avoid an escalation in tensions. Um, America's ambassador in Kiev said the US would refuse to recognize next Sunday's so-called referendum in Crimea and said Washington would take further steps. Obama has come out against self-determination for Crimea as well. And this is uh, from an article I was reading in Global Research. Does Russia have an Africa command? No, but Washington does. Is Russia surrounding the US with military bases? No, but Washington has. Used NATO, whose purpose disappeared 23 years ago, to organize Western, Eastern, and Southern Europe into an empire army with forward bases on Russia's borders. Washington is determined to extend the boundaries of a North Atlantic Treaty Organization to Georgia and Central Asia and to Ukraine on the Black Sea. Both Georgia and Ukraine are former constituent parts of both Russia 
and the Soviet Union. Washington is doing the same thing to China and Iran. Washington is working to establish new air and naval bases in the Philippines, South Korea, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia, with which to block the flow of oil and other resources into China. Iran is surrounded by some 40 military bases and has US fleets standing off its coastline. And that's why I keep using that image of uh, Ai Weiwei's the snake, because it represents the encirclement uh, for me. Among those warning of the risk of a worsening of the crisis was former James Baker III, the late last US Secretary of State who served during the Cold War. I would say we are in a Cold War light already, and we don't need to move further down that road because it could lead to some serious problems in the heart of Europe. Central Africa has paid state wages for the first time in six months. Um, on Monday, a small sign of normality in a country that has been paralyzed by war for over a year. I'll put up a photograph of civil servants queuing in front of a bank in order to get paid after a month of wage arrears in Bangui on March 10. New Yorker Oscar Pistorius' Guns and Tears. Oscar Pistorius, now in the second week of his trial for the murder of Riva Steenkamp, has cried and prayed and has become physically ill in the courtroom in Pretoria and has covered his eyes and his ears doubled over. On Monday, a security officer put a bucket next to Pistorius who vomited into it repeatedly according to press reports. As the pathologist Gert Seyman described how a range of bullets, like the one shot into Steenkamp's brain, open like petals on a flower after entry. This ammunition design used to be sold under the name Black Talon until the line was taken off the market. Its reputation was such that surgeons worried about cutting their fingers on the sharp, shattered edges when they operated on gunshot victims. Pistorius had fired three times through a closed door in his bathroom that led to the toilet, hitting Steenkamp, who was inside, in her skull, her right arm and her right hip. Seyman, who conducted her autopsy, said that either of the two lesser wounds could have killed her too, from the loss of blood, if nothing else. There were even smaller injuries where she was cut by wooden splinters, pieces of the door that the bullets propelled into her body and a bullet passed through the skin between her thumb and forefinger on its way to her head. She may have had her hands over her own ears. What sound would she have been trying to shout out? To shut out powerful stuff, petals on a flower. Currency markets, euros at 138.66, dollar index 79.79, a little bit firmer. Japanese yen 103.27, Swiss franc 0.8786, the pound softer 166.42, and sterling fell as the Bank of England Deputy Governor Charlie Bean said further strength in the currency may hamper the UK's economic recovery. Aussie 0.9027 dropped 0.5% after advancing as high as 0.9133 on March the 7th, which was the strongest level since December the 11th. Indy rupee 60.685, um, uh, it touched 60.6038, which was the strongest level since August the 12th. August the, 12th. the currency has rebounded 13.4% from a record low of 68.845 on August 28. South Korean won 10.64, the real is at 234.62, the Egyptian pound 696.07, South African ran 1074.79. The Aussie tumbled 14% in the past 12 months and is the worst performer of 10 developed nation currencies tracked by Bloomberg. The euro has gained 6.9%. Dollar has declined 0.6%. The Bloomberg dollar spot index rose for a second day, but it's only a marginal increase so far. I'll put up a three month chart of the dollar index. I need to see some more vigor before I can change my mind about how it trades. Euro dollar 138.66. I'll put up a three month chart of that as well. Um, I remain bullish and I think we're headed to 140 dollar yen for 103.27. I'm looking to buy that on any further retracement. Gold was last at 1340.64. Uh, posted a fifth weekly gain last week. Climbed to a four month high of 1354.87 on March 3rd. And uh, this is 
Ukraine, Russia. It's up 11% this year. I think it's well overcooked. Crude oil, 101.16, and I think it's a structural short above 100. Uh, WTI for April delivery was at 101.03, uh, down 9 cents, dropped $1.46 yesterday, closed at the lowest level since February 14th. It had got very, very toppy. Sub-Saharan Africa, Somalis, your religion has been attacked, your land divided, your resources looted directly or indirectly through the puppet government. Our victory lies in jihad. This is Gad Godane in a recorded message. He said landlocked Ethiopia had invaded Somalia in pursuit of access to Somalia's Indian Ocean coastline. The two countries fought a war, 1977-1978. Ethiopia will fail as it has failed in the past and the Muslims will be much stronger, he said. His last public statement came in September when Al-Shabaab claimed responsibility for a deadly raid on a luxury shopping mall, Westgate, in Nairobi. Uh, the aim of the foreign invasion is to divide the remaining Somalia between Kenya and Ethiopia under the cover of the establishment of Somali states, Godana added. Moving on to uh, uh, Juba, shooting in Juba, talking in Addis is the headline for an article in the Africa Confidential, um, talking about the soldiers who were shot up not too long ago, um, but basically striking a relatively optimistic tone that uh, a resolution is closer uh, than it was. The article is on which Rap Arms and in full. I'll put up a photograph of the River Nile scene from Juba. Demonstrators in Juba demanded the resignation of the UN South Sudan envoy Hilda Johnson. More than a thousand people protested. Um, this is about a story that the government said its troops had intercepted weapons in a UN convoy marked as carrying food. South African all share is up 2.82% this year. Dollar versus rag, we're at, still at this 1074.75 level. I'll put up a three-month chart, the Egyptian pound, strong as you like, below seven. I'll also put up a photograph of Sisi meeting yesterday with senior Senegalese officials in Cairo. The Egyptian stock market just dipped below 8,000, but it's still the best-performing stock market in Africa this year, up 17.66%. The Nigerian all shares down 4.9%. The Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index is up 12.68%, but a great deal of that has been eroded by a very weak currency. The FT Beyond Bricks has got an article about Ghana terming it the most fragile of all. The discovery of oil in a rising consumer class had investors positive about Ghana's growth story. Holding up the West African country is one of the frontier markets to invest in, but the recent broad sell-off at EMs has changed the mood about the country and exposed a slate of problems in need of resolution. I'll put up a chart of the yield on the 10-year Ghana Eurobond uh, during August 2023, shot up over 9.8% at the end of February before cooling. You can see that, and I think it's prone to another sell-off. The Ghana SEDI was the second worst performing African currency out of 24 tracked by Bloomberg over the past 12 months, weakening 25% against the dollar. It was stronger only than the new Sudanese pound and a lot weaker than the rand, which lost 14.4% over the same period. Economic growth forecast to be 6% this year next, uh, but that's against an average for, of 7.2% 2000 through 2013. IMF expects growth this year of 5.5%. Uh, slow growth is partly due to weaker prices of commodities, gold, Ghana is the world's second biggest producer after South Africa. Oil revenues, with which Ghana began exporting in 2010, haven't been as strong as budgeted. Uh, somebody saying Ghana isn't in a crisis yet, but if the growth drops to 5% or below and the fiscal deficit remains, there'll be real trouble. Um, and basically saying, Another fellow, Sheelan Shah at Capital, saying only a small amount of money is borrowed has been used for investment. Too much of public spending goes on public sector pay, which takes nearly 70% of the budget. Um, 
the government's promising to boost its coffers through a rise in taxes. And I said, you know, the recurrent expenditure component of African budgets is the Achilles heel of Africa's renaissance. Ghana is going to get crunched, in my view, and worse. I'll put up uh, the chart showing you the, the yield of the Ghana Eurobond. Coming here to Kenya, Cairo's loss is a big boost for Nairobi. While the Arab Spring was intended to improve the lot of citizens, an unintended consequence of political upheaval has been the loss of Cairo as a regional business capital. Nairobi in Kenya has been the beneficiary, according to Peter Wellborn, chairman of Knight Frank Africa. Cairo used to be a strategic location for business, but it's no longer acceptable regionally. Johannesburg is a key capital city, and Nairobi is now the capital of East Africa, so to speak. From Southern Africa and up to the East Coast, there are no other cities regarded by business as being key capitals until you cross the Mediterranean. We've lost Cairo. Mr. Wellborn said that in Nairobi, four years' worth of office supply had been taken up in the past 18 months. We've seen regional headquarter occupiers take strategic buildings in conjunction with their existing operations in Johannesburg. Nairobi is a key area to invest in good tenant demand, good occupiers, an English legal system, and a land registry which is really well organized so you can understand tenure. It's also stable. Outside Nairobi said Kampala and Uganda offered good strategic opportunities in retail and office space on the back of oil and gas. One in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, looks set to prosper from the largest gas field discovered in the world to date. Mozambique beginning to attract attention. Maputo is based at the southern end of the country, but there are plans to undertake big strategic developments in the north, again related to oil and gas. He's saying tenure is an issue in Mozambique. He's speaking of Nigeria, Accra, um, and, uh, and then mentioning this. Uh, as an example, Mr. Wellborn said the UAE signed a deal with Conakry, Guinea, to buy more than 5 billion tons of bauxite to ship back to the UAE and refine it in its second aluminium smelter. Wellborn said the deal was to last nine years and could be worth up to $7 billion in total. If you think of what that amount of money can do to an economy of that size, it's mind-boggling. That's just one mineral in one country. I think that's a real positive. But in Africa, unfortunately, history does not bode well. On that note, I'll put up that view of Nairobi I took about 45 days ago. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Kenyan Jui Kompani for the copy of uh, my book, Den of Iniquities. Um, uh, which is really is a pot boiler, and I'll jump you to page 22. When it rains, all hell breaks loose, this is about Nairobi. Hundreds of thousands of Nairobians in a sudden, unexplained and irrational fear of rain scuttle off work early to form a maddening stream of panicky human traffic. The result is a quagmire of rushing bodies. In the downpour, pedestrians get knocked down, cars smash into each other, humans collide, Bodies splash into the puddles with their belongings still clutched in their soaked hands. It is a stream, a scene straight out of the Tower of Babel. My piece over the weekend was about Uhuru's salary cut, good but much more needed. I said I was reading an article in the venerable Wall Street Journal on Friday morning. The article was touching on the recent weakness of a number of African uh, currencies, and I quote, I command the resurrection of the city in the name of Jesus, preached evangelist Nicholas Duncan Williams of a mega church called Action Chapel recently. Then he addressed Satan, take your hands off the central bank. In Ghana, the city lost 11% against the dollar in the first two months of 2014. Some radio personalities blamed uh, the free fall on the devil. These dwarves, the black magic is what made the city lose value, said a political organizer. And then the article concluded that compounding these pressures from afar is a problem of Africa's own making, big budget deficits. And I said the Ghana SEDI has been in free fall for a while. The Zambia Quache is at a record low. The South African Rand has fallen over 20%. The Kenya shilling, interestingly, has outperformed its peer. And I responded to that article. I said the Achilles heel of the African resurgence is the recurrent expenditure component of the budgets. 
essentially government in Africa is fabulously expensive and its productivity, productivity is shockingly low. As our economies grow in Africa, seeking to accelerate its convergence, it's happening about that, let there be no doubt, African governments are beginning to load their balance sheets. The train wreck risk, whilst a residual one, might grow because I have yet to see or meet an African politician who is prepared to take a scalpel to the cost of delivering government in Africa. Then, on Friday, after I've written out, I learned that President Uhuru Kenyatta and Deputy President William Ruto will take a 20% pay cut, while members of the Cabinet will see their pay reduced by 10% with immediate effect. Kenyatta said a new policy will restrict foreign journeys to only the most essential. Kenya is spending close to $4.6 billion in salaries, leaving only $2.3 billion for development. Just consider that figure. It's just a drop in the ocean, isn't it? Uh, Kenyatta said we need to deal with this monster if we are to develop this nation. Otherwise, sooner or later, we will become a nation that only collects taxes to pay ourselves. I said... The president is sending the right signal through the noise, but he has to wield the scalpel now. Then on Bloomberg, the slice of our national cake devoted to development expenditure would continue to dwindle if we do not contain the pressure of wages. It is time to put the monster to rest, and we wish to lead by example. Apparently, the construction of the Lamu port berths is set for June. That note, I'll put up a photograph of the setting sun in Lamu, and the seafront in Lamu as well. Kenya Airways beat the world's most prestigious airlines to emerge top in keeping time at London's Heathrow Airport in February 2014. I'm looking forward to getting on a timely flight on Friday night. Elephants know how dangerous we are from how we speak. The elephants in the Amboseli region are so aware of this that they can even distinguish between Ma, the language of the Maasai, and other languages, says a team of researchers who report their findings today in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The results add to our growing knowledge of the discriminatory abilities of the elephant mind and how elephants make decisions and see their world. Indeed, previous studies have shown that the Amboseli elephants can tell the cattle herding red-robed red Maasai apart from the agricultural, more blandly dressed neighbours, the Kamba people, simply by scent and the colour of their dress. The elephants know too that walking through villages on weekends is dangerous as is crop raiding during the full moon. Intriguingly, when the Amboseli elephants encounter red cloths such as those worn by the Maasai, they also react aggressively, but they employ a different tactic when they catch the scent of a Maasai man. They run away, smelling the scent of a Kamba man, however it troubles them far less. They have very clear behavioural responses in all of these situations, says Karen McComb. We wondered if they would react differently to different human voices. The Amboseli elephants were also sufficiently tuned in to the Maasai language that they could tell women's and boys' voices from men's, seldom turning tail in response. Maasai women and boys don't kill elephants, Shannon points out. Nor were the elephants tricked by the man's altered voice when they heard it. They left at once. They are incredible creatures. They really are. And I, for one, love them. I've put up a photograph of the elephants as they cross the road in front of me in that very same park, the Amboseli. This was in September 2013. And then uh, some, about three or four years ago, we were in there. And you can see an ostrich in the foreground. You can see the elephants in the background. And I think you can see Mount Kilimanjaro there as well. Kenya shilling is at 86.50. We've been here for quite a while. The Nairobi all shares up 3.95% this year. NSE 20 had a strong session uh, yesterday, up 0.75%, and it's back into positive territory, uh, plus 0.36%. If you need to check any share, please click on that link uh, for rich data, which is on the front page of the website, and uh, at the last item on which wrap-ups. Thank you once again for stopping by.